But the economic crisis, I think, was long in the making. No other institution, the IMF was not willing to step in. Nobody was willing to step in. India played a crucial role in stabilizing the economy. I think where we failed was in creation of wealth. We didn't create wealth in the private sector. We did not restructure the economy. From a strategic point of view, uh, Hambantota has been of concern to India. And we have very clearly given an assurance that it will not be allowed for military use. Comparing the relationship with India with somebody else, whether it's the Chinese or the Americans, it doesn't make sense because we are the same blood. So, as Mr. Jayashankar put it best, uh, he said blood is thicker than water when somebody asked why did India help. The three people who have always given me access regardless of any crisis they may be facing, one is Dr. Jayashankar, the other is Mr. Doval, and the other is Mrs. Sita Raman. I think uh, we, we lost some confidence with what happened last year because that had wide publicity. So we should not make the mistakes of the past, that's important. And especially mm -hmm. in the geopolitical field, I think there are lessons to be learned. India has been my first love in many ways and I have had a long relationship with India. Namaste Jai Hind, welcome to another edition of ANI Podcast with Smita Prakash. Today my guest is the Sri Lankan High Commissioner to India. Featuring in this conversation will be two topics, which is India-Sri Lanka relations and the economic crisis that Sri Lanka faced in 2022 and whether it has managed to overcome most of those obstacles. For those who are not familiar with these topics, here's a short primer. Also joining me in this podcast is my colleague Naveen Kapoor. Sri Lanka's economy hit rock bottom in 2022 as it defaulted on international loans. It faced rampant fuel and food shortages and massive street protests. The government imposed a state of emergency and President Gotabaya Rajapaksha had to flee the country, leaving a huge economic and political crisis in the country. After the civil war of 2009, the then president Mahinda Rajapaksha, brother of Gotabaya, took out massive foreign loans to pay for war expenses and infrastructure projects, including from the Chinese. A debt trap, nepotism and corruption added to the mess. Street protests erupted. In May last year, Gotabaya appointed Ranil Vikramasinghe as the prime minister, his sixth time in the job. On India-Sri Lanka relationship, it's a complex one. It goes back historically to more than 2,000 years. The southern nation has an intellectual, cultural, trade, religious and linguistic links with India. But in the 1970s and 80s, Sri Lanka was plunged into a civil war with Tigers of Tamil Elam, LTTE, a separatist insurgent force on one side and the Sri Lankan government on the other. India got involved in the ethnic conflict, sent a peacekeeping force. A thousand Indian soldiers died in that conflict. A peace accord was signed between Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi and President Jayawardhane in Colombo in 1987, called the Indo-Sri Lanka Peace Accord, to end the civil war by bringing in the 13th Amendment to the Sri Lankan constitution. But the civil war has not ended. According to Sri Lankan government figures, over 20,000 people are missing due to various conflicts, including a three-decade brutal war with the Lankan Tamils in the north and east, which claimed at least 100,000 lives. International rights groups claim at least 40,000 ethnic Tamil civilians were killed in the final stages of the war. But the Sri Lankan government has disputed the figures. To talk more on the complex India-Sri Lanka relationship, we have in the studio the Sri Lankan High Commissioner, Mr. Milinda Moragoda. Thank you, sir, for joining our podcast. Uh, Naveen and I are very honoured that you're here with us. And viewers and listeners want to know a lot about uh, what happened in Sri Lanka in 2022 and how it's been able to overcome uh, the obstacles and what are the steps it is taking uh, to overcome that economic crisis that that it faced. So we'll get into that in detail and also the India-Sri Lanka relationship. But thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for inviting me. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you, sir. And uh, uh, for viewers and listeners, uh, the High Commissioner has been uh, very kind. He wants me to address him by his first name. So I am going to try my level best <laughs> to take that informal please, route with please. you, sir. Uh, so um, let me begin by asking you about uh, what happened in 2022? What led to the crisis, the economic crisis? Uh, Naveen also has some questions on that. So let's begin with that. With the economic crisis, I think I have always, even in my public statements, mentioned that it was long in the making, in the sense that since independence, we have been 
mean, 75 years of independence now, we have been living beyond our means. In fact, I mean, to give you a statistic, 80% of our government revenues were spent on salaries and pensions for government servants. We have a country of 22 million people. We have nearly over maybe 1.7 million government servants and maybe 300,000 people drawing pensions from the budget. So 2 million people. So you can imagine the ratio that, that is there. So it was a build-up. Then, of course, through that period, we had a war of 30 years, which is expensive. The peak period of our youth, our demographic dividend, if you will, was also spent during the war. So it was a cumulative impact. Then we had COVID. And then, of course, we had the Ukrainian crisis, which had, which had its own impact. This was a build-up. And we really did not restructure our economy, I think, to face the modern mm -hmm. challenges. I mean, that's the broad picture, but you may have more detailed questions. So it was a build-up. It then led to an economic crisis. We ran into uh, scarcities. Uh, we had foreign exchange, a foreign exchange crisis. And then uh, people came out onto the streets. And then that led to a social crisis, a political crisis. And uh, India, and this I must re-emphasize re at every point, played a crucial role in stabilizing the economy. Last year, you provided us with 4 billion US dollars. That is what stabilized us. No other institution, the IMF was not willing to step in. Nobody was willing to step in. So if that stabilization had not happened and we were not able to import our oil and other essential supplies, probably we would have had a serious, uh, much more serious disruption than we had. We had a serious disruption, but it would have been much more violent. So I, I, I think in that context, I've always said that, you know, the role play, India played was very, very unique. and. Of course, we are grateful to Prime Minister Modi and to others in the cabinet for that. We'll get to that uh, uh, about India-Sri Lanka relationship uh, and on the trade and on other bilateral issues. But before that, you know, um, even though there was mismanagement, the world had this view that Sri Lanka was really one of the success stories. That, you know, the basic necessities of life were being provided, whether it was health whether it was education, it was being provided and it was this on an upward trajectory. So you said that there was mismanagement. So were the signs not evident to the politicians, uh, to the people that there is a crisis brewing? It is not just outside influences, which you said, the Ukrainian war, COVID, and then the terror attacks, uh, you know, that happened, yes. uh, which hit the tourism industry. But there were inherent weaknesses which were not visible to the world. I think that we, we, since independence, we have invested heavily in uh, our quality of life indices. I mean, education, health, uh, and that has paid off. We have to be proud of that. There is no question about it. But I think we did not orient this towards the market. Now, for example, our education system, we have a very high standard of literacy, but there is no, they do that, what we produce out of the universe, out of the universities, do not really meet the requirements of the workplace. Uh, health, we have a high standard, uh, we have a, our uh, life expectancy is high, so in every aspect there we can be proud of that. But I think where we failed was in creation of wealth. We, we did not create wealth, so we just spent money and we did not create wealth. And as a consequence, uh, and then we built up a very large government service. Our youth, for example, are used to basically their first line of recourse is a government job, not to look for work anywhere mm -hmm. else. So, for example, we have art, fa art faculties where some years the whole uh, graduation batch is taken by the government. They have to absorb it. Now, when I was economic reform minister in 2001, 2002, I think the government service was around 600,000, 700,000 people. Today, it is double that. That's 20 years ago. Because people just kept on getting absorbed. We didn't create wealth in the private sector. We did not restructure the economy. So the state was into everything from running hotels to hospitals to everything was done by the state. Uh, so the idea of having a private sector that could also su supply some of these services, we did not really focus enough on that. So sir, how do you sustain this now? Now you said that so many people are fed with the budget. So how are you going to sustain it? Do you, are you seeing any viable model which you have built up now? Or? Now, what is being tried is that, I mean, we have gone to the IMF more than a dozen times. Each time we stabilize the economy and we do not get into the structural changes, we then move on. Mm 
So this time round, we will have to work with the IMF to not only stabilize. In fact, the early stages of stabilization was done by India. I mean, that was part of the process. But now the IMF stabilization will take place. And then after that, we have to look at the growth agenda. Now in the growth agenda, uh, we have to restructure our power sector, our petroleum sector. We have to get the state out of businesses. You know, so India is the greatest example. You have highways, you have power, you have ports, you have airports. It's all managed by the private sector. So as I see it, and we can discuss that when you're ready, but is that integrating with India in some of these sectors is going to be the way forward for us. Because last year, our economy, uh, basically we had a negative economic growth of around 7.5%. This year, we are expecting it to be negative again over 3%. So ten, our economy by the end of this year would have shrunk by over 10%. Mm -hmm. Yours is going to be growing by 6%. So if we can hook the two economies on, that is the way out. How are you planning to... Well, I, I think I say integration and connectivity. On integration, I would like to think we should look at expanding. We have a free trade agreement. I'd like to see us expanding on that. Then we could, for example, linkages in electricity. We are looking at linking up, up the power cable between India and Sri Lanka so that we could maybe export power to you and also possibly import power from India. Oil pipeline, for example, because we do not need our own refinery. We can probably buy from you through oil pipelines. Then, of course, there's nothing wrong with dreaming that you can get on a trade in Colombo and get off in Chennai. Why not? I mean, this is a... Just yeah, that's 50, very 60. ambitious. No, but, uh, with, but it's but not expensive the, to do. But, but is it. the political establishment on board in your country on that? I think it has to be incremental. I think the, the power cable should be the first step. Then I think we could uh, take, a, t take a, another step with the pipeline, mm -hmm. step by step. Because in my view, we have to also basically change mm -hmm. this, this whole... Uh, I mean, the idea of being maybe insecure vis-a-vis -vis India... And sometimes, frankly, India being insecure vis-a-vis -vis us as to, you know, yeah. which way are we turning. It will change dramatically if we can integrate. Right. So we have, it's a lot of work. And uh, I mean, uh, I think being a broadcaster here in your case, uh, Edward Murrow, I think, spoke of the last three feet. Huh. That in public diplomacy, it's not about all what one does, you know, technically. It's finally the face-to-face, -face, okay. the final connection between human beings that matters. I think that's where we have to work on it. People to people exchanges, you know, and, and trying to convince the populations that we are basically from the same gene pool. Anyway, we can discuss There's that. There's a part. lot of history, right? Uh, I know this was supposed to come in the second half of the podcast, but then I guess uh, it's taken a momentum of its own. You see, there's a history to it uh, also, right? You know it being a politician and not a career diplomat. Uh, you understand the the um, it's thorny path when you, uh, because of the conflict that one has gone through in the 80s and in the 90s with the Sri Lankan conflict, with the IPKF and all those things. So to transcend that and to let bygones be bygones, to move away from that conflict situation, you are still grappling with that in your country. So do you think that the relationship can go further beyond that? I think it has to for our sake and for the sake of the region. Uh, I think basically between an India and Sri Lanka, when you look at it, I mean, uh, external affairs minister Jayashankar put it best. Uh, he said blood is thicker than water when somebody asked why did India help at the last mm. year. We, we are from basically the same bloodline, same gene pool. Mm. On the other side, our civilizational links go back to the Ramayana, to Buddhism. I mean, it is, uh, it is very close. And geographically, we are just a few kilometers apart. So I think there is no choice. And in a way, this is, a, I think, the ideal mo moment for it. Because, I mean, what happened last year, the economic turbulence, I think we have to learn some lessons on the economic side from that. I think the current president is trying to give that leadership. Uh, I think the population also begin, has to begin to think what is the best way forward. Uh, old prejudices, not easy to do. Yeah. And you're right. I mean, as a politician, I know how difficult it is to change mindsets. But it is a time to start thinking thinking afresh. And I think on the Indian side also, we have to build trust. The two sides has to tr have to trust each other more. Yes. We should not be, you know, in the strategic sense, we have to become closer aligned. I think this is the time to think that way. I don't think another moment like this will come again, frankly. 
So coming back to the issues which led to this economic crisis, do you also blame the debt, the debt issue on the China? Well, you see, debt, yes. If you look at our total debt, that is the debt that is being uh, at the moment dealt with within the perimeter of uh, restructuring, we have around $30 billion. Of the, that $30 billion, half of it, I would say, 50, I mean, it's very rough, $15 billion is private debt and $15 billion is uh, sovereign debt. Of the $15 billion sovereign debt, I would say China is $3 billion. Of the uh, Paris, Club. 15, Paris Club is next, I think, about 2.7 or 2.4. So, and then India is there. So, a billion, China, I think. Exactly, a little over a billion. Yeah. And then on the other side, you have the private debt. The private debt, nearly $12 billion, is consists of bonds that we have issued that are held by U.S. investment banks and, you know, Western investment banks. So, it's a mix. With China, the challenge will come when we go in for restructuring because they have never dealt with this kind of situation before, whereas the rest of the world have. Now, India, uh, the, the Paris Club and, uh, have, uh, and Japan have Japan agreed. Japan initiated. Have, have, exactly. They have agreed yeah. to uh, restructure the debt. China has still not fully come on board. They have given broad indications. but the, the, So that is going to be the challenge because it would be probably the first time that China has to face a situation like this because earlier... The Chinese felt that they could deal outside the financial system or at least the financial system that was established with the Bretton Woods framework. The Chinese felt they could deal outside that. So now that's going to be a conversation. Now where that will end up, I don't know. But there is a commitment on the part of our government that the process will be transparent so that everybody will get the same kind of treatment. But China is the biggest creditor. Well, I mean, it's out yes. of this initiative. No, well, they have, for the first stage, they agreed in the sense that the IMF wanted all the lenders to agree to, the IMF has a, something called a debt sustainability analysis, which has worked out the amount of debt that we can afford to have. So, the, the, uh, the, they wanted all the creditors to commit to that framework. Now, uh, initially, uh, India committed. India is not part of the Paris Club. And for India also, this is a new experience. New experience, clearly. yes. But, but India committed. India was the first. In fact, before the Paris Club committed, India committed. China basically signaled that they are willing to go ahead. Hmm. But now, through the process only, we will see what will happen. So, this next six months will be critical for us to see where we are headed. Sir, you said that you are going to integrate the two economies, like we can really benefit from the integration of the Indian. That's the hope, yeah? yes. Right. So, in this, do you see a big role of the private Indian companies like Adani's or like uh, Reliance or others? It has to be private. It has to be private. To be I mean, private. if you look at now, Adani is already… Are you in, in talks? In, yeah, well, we, we already already Adani has invested in a investing in a port uh, in, in a I terminal, the three million right. EU terminal, and he invested at a time when nobody else was coming right. in, so he took a risk, and it will pay off for him. It will be a good investment. Then he's also made a proposal for renewable energy, five hundred megawatts of renewable energy, uh, wind energy in the off the north western coast of Sri Lanka. Uh, the the, the, the we, we are looking at other options, for example, airports. We would like to see one of your airport operators maybe coming in. A a airlines. I mean, you have uh, strong airlines. We are talking to some. I don't want to mention the names, but we are trying to okay. talk to a few of them. So aviation, because tourism is our, you now I saw last month, number one, India again for tourism. So that's uh, that's one of our quick wins. If we can get our growth, for, for our, to get our economic growth going, tourism is a quick win. So, the integration, connectivity is, the, I think, the two key areas. Then looking at the trade agreement, we have a free trade agreement. to we'll see whether we can tweak it further and see how we can maybe, you know, we, we expand on that. Uh, then, of course, rupee trade. Because we have now agreed to mm. trade in Indian rupees. India has agreed. And if we can expand that, that's another way of moving forward. The, the integration would rest on some of these areas. Then, of course, Trincomalee port uh, to see whether that could be made into an energy hub. That's another discussion that is ongoing. Because the Colombo port, 80% of our business is transshipment. Of that 80%, 70% is ship, uh, transshipment into India. So uh, we are basically a port that services India. So I mean, this uh, integration I'm talking about is already happening. It's a matter of how we 
push it on you speak about trincomalee port but of course uh, in india the suspicion and the bugbear is the hambantota port i have a short primer uh, which i have uh, recorded on this uh, for viewers and listeners who don't know about it the hambantota port in sri lanka has been an issue between india and sri lanka for viewers and listeners here's a short primer it's a port in sri lanka that's been leased to china for 99 years 800 hectares of industrial zone surrounding the port was also included in the agreement. Sri Lanka has repeatedly said that it won't allow any country to make the island nation a hub for anything that is harmful to India's national security interests. A Chinese surveillance vessel was at this port last year, and now India will not take Sri Lanka's verbal assurances at face value any more. given the fact that some of sri lanka's politicians have been compromised in the past with ties with china which resulted in taking political and economic decisions not in the strategic interests of sri lanka let alone its relationship with its northern and closest neighbor india back to you sir could you give us a little bit uh, little information about that thorny issue and how uh, india and sri lanka uh, are going around it now basically hamban tota port was offered internationally and it was china who took it up in india at that time did not have strong port developers you know not only hamban tota the chinese operate a port a terminal in colombo as well each time to be fair by us we had offered it to india now on the from a strategic point of view uh, hamban tota has been of concern to india clearly it is not only to india but i think within the the way when it comes to the uh, port, that port as a yeah. whole there has been concerns and we have very clearly given an assurance that it will not be used for allowed to be used for military use there was that chinese uh, surveillance vessel which was spotted this, this there, is right? part of a process of building confidence and i think it can only come through communication now if you look at what happened there of course that incident happened at the height when our one president was leaving and another president was coming in and i mean we were i don't think anybody in colombo was thinking of ships at that time right. although there was a tension <laughs> from this side uh, but the lesson there is we have to have perfect communication and i think uh, whatever i can do in my tenure that is what i am trying to do to ensure that there is perfect communication i mean it's not easy because i mean india is a huge giant and we are small and and communicating each other's concerns and having that dialogue is not easy although we have access to the highest levels here that i have never had a complaint about whenever we need to meet but we need to have that communication and i think there was a lesson learned there there is no question about it that mm. incident taught us a lesson and we need to now learn from it and move on earlier in the conversation you said that india also wants to know which way we also go you know the most uh, countries in india's neighborhood uh, would say the same thing which you said that you know uh, there was a time when the choice was between the americans and the soviet union now with the india china conflict you know which has happened since 2020 uh, are the neighbors the smaller neighbors around india feeling that india and china put this choice before them i think living next to a large neighbor is not easy i mean if you speak to the mexicans or probably i don't know the finns or if you go around southeast asia those whoever is around china it's not an easy it's a reality uh, but i think in the context of the indian ocean i think and the neighborhood we need to work together there is there is no question about that yeah, i mean i think when i mean you look at sri lanka we are an 80 billion dollar economy but you are a five and a half trillion dollar economy you have what over 1.4 billion population we have 22 million population and in many ways it's it's a asymmetric relationship for any neighbor it is an asymmetric relationship so if we think that it is going to be an equal relationship i mean we are also living in a fool's paradise so my my view is that we have to the, the uh, have clear understandings where are the red lines now for example 20 30 years ago during the cold war we got into a similar situation with india because there was a perception that we were closer to the west or especially to the mm. us than india was worried about so i think there are lessons to be learned for us there as well and uh, so today i think th- th- we have to be very clear between us what the red lines are i think not only for us all our neighbors have to understand this 
because for a big power, security is a red line. But then who defines security? I cannot define what your security is. You have to be able to define and say this is the definition. But when you define it, you must be fair by us. I mean, we must be able to trade and deal, but we must be very clear if we cross this line, it's a security problem to, to you. That's why with the integration process, I think increasingly your security and ours will become aligned. Hmm. That's what I feel. I, I think with you, that is the way forward for us. Do you feel, think it's a natural thing? Uh, it's a natural relationship that will thrive if there is an integration as compared to say uh, with what you said was aligning with say an, an America or a Russia or you know or the European nations would aligning with India be a natural way to go you know, about I it? I go back to civilizational Well, when he said blood is thicker than water and uh, the basically we are the same gene pool we are the same civilization and we are geographically neighbors I think for me the perfect relationship is uh, it's a question I always wonder how that was achieved. I'm a Buddhist and uh, King Dharma Shoka sent his son and daughter to Sri Lanka with the message of Buddhism. Now, what made a father send a daughter and a son to a country? And he never knew the king of Sri Lanka. They were Nampiyatis. So they say that he had found out about him. But it's very unclear what made him do that. But the level of trust that he must have had as India's greatest emperor, to do that. Now, that is the relationship for Sri Lanka. I mean, there's nothing else that we need to go after. So I always say we need to get back. I mean, I mean this may sound idealistic or maybe uh, not realistic, but that is, that is the relationship. We have to get back to that level of trust. Can we interpret this as that Sri Lanka is more comfortable in relation to China, to India? They are, we are more comfortable with India working with India than China. My case, I don't think there is a reason even to have that discussion, to even to compare. Because, I mean, comparing the relationship with India with somebody else, whether it's the Chinese or the Americans, it doesn't make sense because we are the same blood. So, th that is our comfort zone. It's clear. Our language, for example, I speak Sinhalese, is a Sanskrit-based language. It is not based on anything to do with China. So our way we think, the way we look at problems, our religions. So I, I mean, I don't think there is an issue there. I think if we start integrating economically and also the last three feet, that is critical. We need to have more people to people exchanges. That's why this idea that someday maybe school kids can get into a train in Colombo and get off in Chennai. Why not? Hmm. Because then you get used to that. I go to Kerala, for example. Kerala is very much like southern Sri Lanka. Yes, yes. I mean, our, they have also high quality of life indices. Uh, if you look at the coconut farms, the people live, the food they eat. It is almost Sri Lanka. If I mean, if I don't know, I'm not in Sri Lanka. In Kerala, I will I would think. But I sir, the fact remains that if you see the geopolitics, definitely there is a competition going on between India and China in the region. So, Sri Lanka is definitely part of that, uh, you know, the larger game which is going on. How do you look at that? Like you say, yeah, we understand that we have our civilizational links, we have a tie, we are very close. But at the same time, there is a strategic, what you say, competition going on between the two big countries. How do you look at that, sir? Basically, the competition is going on not only between India and China, but between, you know, it's a much larger contest even than that. I think for us, we are too big to you know, play any role within that competition. For us, as I said, 22 million people, $80 billion economy, we have to look after, ensure that we start growing this economy. I mean, at the moment, we have a, almost a false calm because we are not paying our debts. We are not really importing anything. From next year, we have to start paying our debts. We have to start importing. We have to grow the economy. So the only way forward is you're growing at 6% and we have shrunk by 10%. We should try to move right. that way. So in my view, uh, the big issue is frankly, I mean, I may have an opinion on it, but I, I don't think we can address it for a while. We really need to get out of the situation we are in. So you spoke about I'm not trying to duck your question. All <laughs> I'm saying is that we have to focus our, our No, you're not a diplomat, but you gave a diplomatic answer. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, civilizational links that you spoke about, but there's also the the thorn in the flesh when it comes to the Tamil Elam 
uh, issue. That is also a civilizational link, whether it is the language, whether it's the people, and whether it's the Elam issue. So could you tell us about how things have moved on that front? I think we have to start addressing it. I mean, our society is polarized. There is no question about it. I mean, it on racial lines, it's polarized. On uh, religious lines, it's polarized. Even on class lines, it's polarized. Although we are a small country, it, we have many, many uh, different sort of divisions. So I think we have to, uh, pause after the war, the war ended in 2009, I think we have taken too long in a way in trying to work on the reconciliation. And then in the middle of all that, we had this uh, other terror attack as well, which brought in another dimension. The Easter we, Sunday Easter attack. Easter Sunday attack. So uh, that brought in another dimension. I mean, all these, we have to think about it. So I think our current president is trying to, to look at it, uh, both while his initial priority is to address the you know, economic equity inequities, the developmental side, and then he wants to see how he can address the The 13th Amendment, sir, yeah. the meeting happened and what, what the discussion that? is going on on that. I mean, I feel, you see, I was involved in the peace process of 2001. I was, you know, uh, highly involved in it. What I found is that at every stage, Politics gets in the way because everybody has a line they take and they want to hold the line. Now, I was hoping that I always say that now I'm 58 and I say I hope that the next generation will at least not have the prejudices and maybe the, 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 the blocks that I have. Uh, so we need to, I think, there has to be some discussion, some honest discussion about it. And maybe again, this is the time because the economic crisis we went through last year, there were times at which I think people were able to get together across ethnic lines. It was visible. Although, in a, again, I don't uh, romanticize what happened last year. I mean, some people say that the, it was like an Arab Spring exercise last year. Now, I, I frankly don't see virtue in disruption. In my view, we have to, I mean, we have to basically find these solutions through democratic frameworks. We can't go outside. But I think what happened last year has sent a signal to the political system. It is very clear. Now, if you look at our current president, he is looking at how he can increase youth representation in the parliament. A few days ago, he had a discussion where he's, he has brought in, he has selected young people through an application process to act as observers on the parliamentary committees that are the, the oversight committees of parliament, they, they will be these youth observers. So his idea, I think, is step by step to try to create a new sort of a political space for the youth. Maybe, frankly, that is the solution. Maybe to have our diversity in that also, to include Tamils also in that? That, that is happening. He, he has done that. Uh, the Tamils, Muslims, and of course, we also have a big divide, which uh, I, that uh, that uh, I see here, which is an interesting debate, and uh, we have it as well. Within the Sinhalese, people who think in Sinhala and people who think in English, mm. <laughs> there, there, there is that crack is there, and and as a politician, I see it all the time because there is a perception that you know the certain privileged elite, a patrician elite who worked with the British had all Correct. got all the privileges and that uh, th that uh, although we had a democracy it was only restricted to a certain class or a certain a certain group of families that perception is very much there in sri lanka so that is another crack that uh, the, the division that has to be looked at so uh, my view is that we have to go outside the old paradigms to find the solution and what happened last year the disruption if you will Again, I say I'm not looking at, we, we, we should not see virtue in every disruption because some people think in politics also you need to have a Google or a mm. Airbnb or uh, Amazon to, you know, disrupt the whole system. But that can be dangerous, I think, because we are dealing with something quite serious here. But I think it is helpful. I think what happened last year is now getting our politicians to think. I think the next election, which will probably come sometime in next, uh, next, sometime next year, may be the opportunity to look at everything afresh. That is my feeling. 
and, and uh, this is just a thought. There right? was also this anger towards the political class. Yes. Uh, that one saw out there. See that the visuals. The visuals were kind of scary. You know that that we saw that there was so much of anger that a revolution is what they thought that they're just these few families which have got a grip and uh, it's not representational democracy anymore. So you saw it spiraling out of order but somehow there seems to be a little more order. But uh, is there, are there checks and balances in place to see that, uh, you know, people's movement doesn't uh, degenerate into uh, into something that that could result in chaos absolutely no that we have to be very careful about and that's why i said that uh, there is a tendency sometime among liberals to see virtue in these disruptions i mean there is a virtuous aspect maybe but i think uh, one has to be careful that the whole system doesn't get destroyed because some of the more extreme elements in that movement wanted to bring everything down they wanted they actually went up to the parliament trying to take over the parliament they took over the to be sort of fair by them, there was no violence. But I feel that, as I felt that the, the fact that India provided us the funding and that the crisis didn't hit at that level, otherwise we would have had violence, I think. Uh, but uh, they, 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 they even went as far as trying to take over the parliament, but then the law enforcement authorities were able to control it. So I think the, 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 uh, th that has to be avoided. But the idea that the system must change, even I, as somebody who has served 10 years in parliament, uh, feel the system has to be changed. There is a disconnect. And, and to me, all this, in a way, is about the last three feet, you know, what, 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 mm. uh, what is, I mean, I always think, you know, what, what the, the, we seem to, as a political class, we are disconnected from what people are thinking on the street. Yeah. And I think last year was a wake-up call. So I would not throw everything out, but nor would I say that everything they stood for is right. Mm. I mean, I'm a believer in a middle path. I mean, that is Buddhism ultimately, the middle path. And middle. I think that's where we have to. Sir, despite all the good relations with India and India being the first mover whenever there is a crisis, don't you think, sir, this uh, dilly-dallying of the implementation of 13th Amendment, which ma'am also asked recent, don't you think that that is a big, big obstacle in our smooth sailing of our relationship because there is a big population here who wants to see Tamils getting full rights in your country. Here's a short primer for details that viewers and listeners might not know about this. Ranil Vikrama Singhe, who took over as the president last year, has underlined the need to fully implement the 13th Amendment to the Constitution to grant political autonomy to the minority Tamils in the country. The 13A provides for devolution of powers to the Tamil community in Sri Lanka. India has been pressing Sri Lanka to implement 13A, which was brought in after the Indo-Sri Lankan Agreement of 1987. Over to you, sir. You see, the 13th Amendment got stuck by an amendment that was brought, and I don't want to get into finger-pointing because it's not right. the time for that. But uh, in, in, during the previous government, uh, that was before Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa came into office. There was an effort to try to restructure, redo the de redo devolution. And the Tamil parties also supported the mechanism that was used, which ultimately suspended, uh, they, they got into it. There was a difficulty in holding the provincial elections because of that. Now there must be unity in the parliament. The 13th Amendment is not suspended at all. It is just that the way in which the election is going to be held had to be determined. They wanted to redo the lines at, right. on a national level. Uh, there was a re demarcation to be done and certain changes to be made. All the parties in parliament at that time agreed to this change. Uh, and, and what happened, I think, is finally it got caught up in all kinds of detail. As you know, this uh, gerrymandering that takes place when you start redemarcating boundaries and yes. it got caught up in that. Now, to come out of it, Parliament again has to come to some kind of consensus. That is where it is stuck. Now, I think that is what the President is trying to resolve, how to do it. And to do that, he has to be able to get some kind of consensus in, within Parliament. And that's what he is trying to do. So, let's see what happens. Since you are here, sir, I want to raise another two big questions which keep on concerning the Indian audience and the Indian Tamils mainly. One, the fishermen's. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, they cross the uh, line and they get arrested and some, in some cases, I think there was some killed also. So, how do you address this issue? And there's also another story which keep on resurfacing 
that Prabhakaran is alive. You know, <laughs> some uh, politician, a very seasoned politician, recently made this uh, claim that Prabhakaran is alive and he is alive. Can you give, give us some sense on both these issues? The second one, I'm not sure what answer I can give. But uh, on the first one, the fisheries issue is one of the few, I suppose, uh, bilateral issues we have. I mean, if you take away the bigger geo geopolitical issues. And there we have had, we, we have ongoing discussions, both at the policy level, but also on the ground. Basically, there are three uh, points that I like to make on that. The first is the fact that legally, obviously, it is uh, Indian, uh, South Indian fishermen crossing the boundary. So that's a reality on a legal side. But the second aspect is the ecological issue because the use of this bottom trawling methods basically tends to destroy the fish beds. Now, on, on, on the Indian side, the fish beds have been totally destroyed because of overfishing. And our side, we, since during the war, there was, no, there was no fishing taking place because that was in the conflict zone. Uh, we, our fish beds are still intact. And the, the lot of the fishermen who are coming across are using this bottom trawling techniques, which will destroy the, 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 the uh, fish bed. So that is one of the concerns we have about what is happening, even getting, forgetting about the law when people cross. The issue for both sides, I think, is the humanitarian livelihoods issue. How do we come to a compromise on that? Because I think on the first two, there is no disagreement between India and Sri Lanka. We, we both agree that legally, this is on our side that some of this fishing is legal fishing is taking place, that the Indian fishermen are crossing the line or uh, South, South Indian fishermen. But uh, the ecological issue also India agrees because this bottom trawling will destroy any future prospects and environmentally it is, it is also a problem. And uh, so therefore, we, we have to look for ways of trying to help these fishermen find alternate livelihoods or, or maybe deep water fishing, trying to get them to go out to deep sea fishing. That's yeah. what India is trying to do. I think South India and Tamil Nadu government has been trying to, uh, uh, to I think, uh, for, uh, provide deep water boats for, uh, for long, long range fishing and all that. And then, of course, the other issue is the uh, Sri Lankan fishermen who are using more, they, they are not using deep water, the, 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 this uh, bottom trawling, trawling. techniques. Mm. They are basically more artisanal fishing fishermen. They are clashing also with Indian fishermen. And these are, so it's Tamil fishermen who are in the north. I mean, this is not southern fishermen who are clashing. Sri Lankan yeah. Tamils and Indian Tamils. Yes, and yes. We, we have to avoid that also because we have to make sure it's a, it's a livelihoods issue and it's a humanitarian issue. So the, the discussions are taking place at a very practical level, at a policy level, different options are being considered, but it is, I don't think, an issue that can be resolved overnight. I, I doubt mm -hmm. it. My concern is if it continues like this, it might naturally get resolved because the, the fish may basically die out mm. because that is what has happened on uh, the Indian, Indian side. side. So this is, this is something which... Uh, it's also me. in India, it becomes an issue simply also because of the... Uh, Tamil Nadu government involvement in this issue also and it's Tamil Nadu always has a government in place which is not the same uh, political party which is there in New Delhi <laughs> so uh, it becomes an issue so you uh, spoke about the Easter Sunday attack I want to talk about that and uh, you know I think 260 people died in that terror attack and now there's a new terror law that you are uh, your government is mulling about uh, there's also misgivings about this that <coughs> it will give too much power in the hands of policemen and the ethnic minorities are scared that it will be used against them. So, there are pros and cons to have a strong uh, anti-terror act. I mean, all countries have debated on this. We've had this debate in India when we had a law called POTA. Mm -hmm. That got changed. America had the Patriot Act. They have, every country debates about it. What? How is the debate going in your country on that? It is a very emotional debate. I, I think it's not resolved yet. There are different, as you rightly said, I mean, there is a civil liberties aspect which has to be taken into consideration. How much uh, power do you uh, allow? And especially that need to have a judicial supervision when you detain people. Uh, I think uh, it is going through that debate. I mean, the government brought in a bill, then, as you know, they have uh, taken it, they are now discussing it further. Uh, because what, after what happened on Easter Sunday and 
having endured 30 years of terrorism, I mean, our society is very sensitive to it. But equally, I think we, we realize that civil liberties have to be protected. I mean, otherwise we are a democracy and, and we, we, we have to, that, that is a reality. So my hope is that through a democratic process, uh, we will come with a balanced outcome. So I, I know, as you, as you rightly say, it's still under debate. Right. And tourism is a major, major revenue earner. That got hit because of that Easter Sunday attack. Uh, how is that reviving and what role can India play in that, India-Sri Lanka relations in that? I think India can play a critical role because that is our quickest way of for recovery, the tourism. So if we can have uh, more connectivity and uh, now, I mean, I, have, I was a tourism minister in 2000 and I guess uh, just before the war and the war ended when we had only like 300 or thousand tourists. But even at that time, there was an idea which we discussed for Indian tourism. That is that if we could, this is again like my idea of a railway line. It's a out of the box idea. But if you can now, if you recall, if you fly to Abu Dhabi now and you want to fly to the U.S., you clear U.S. customs and immigration in Abu Dhabi. Hmm. And so when you arrive in Abu Dhabi, it's a local flight. Now, if we can think of, you know, out-of-the-box solutions like that, where people, we, where we, we have Indian customs and immigration potentially in Colombo, so the, the, you can clear that and you can fly into anywhere in India and then from some of the domestic airports, you can come in there and go in. I mean, that's, an, that's one extreme. Yeah. But the idea is to, to increase connectivity between India and Sri Lanka. And, and also make it affordable connectivity. So in that way, for example, airlines like Indigo make a lot of sense because they offer affordable travel. So we have to keep increasing that connectivity. We were getting there before COVID, and now again, we have to start again. Hmm. Is there confidence still uh, as Sri Lanka is a destination among the international community? I think uh, we, we lost some confidence with what happened last year because that had wide publicity. The Easter attacks, as you said, also there was a drop. We were just picking ourselves up when last year happened. Now again, we can see it, it's improving. Right. So, I mean, as you know, I mean, uh, this is always very sensitive to mm. perception. So Perception, exactly. I was going to come to that because Imran Khan recently, he said that he was talking to his own people and he said that our situation uh, is becoming worse and or has become worse than Sri Lanka's. He used that. I mean, I don't know whether many Pakistanis know about what mm. happened in Sri Lanka, but it's a Sri Lanka kind of uh, situation out there in the sense that they're there's no, they don't have petrol for their vehicles. Uh, Atta, which is wheat, which they, which is consumed more than rice, which is consumed in uh, uh, in Sri Lanka, they consume more of wheat. That is not available. It's very expensive. So he is talking about mismanage of the political class in their country. He made this comparison uh, when he came up with Sri Lanka. It was a Bloomberg report, but he was explaining to his people about that. What does it feel uh, sitting in Sri Lanka to be called as a country which has a failing economy by a country like Pakistan? I don't think we feel good. Whoever calls us that, whether it's Pakistan or anybody else. I think, well, I mean, we have to just, uh, I mean, we have been resilient. Sri Lankans are resilient. And what I always feel is if you, we have nearly 2 million Sri Lankans working outside Sri Lanka doing very well, whether it's in the Middle East or in the US or as expatriates, as uh, diaspora, we are very successful. But for some reason, we have not been able to achieve that success at home. So, I mean, I think it's nothing to do with us as people. It's something to do with, I always say, we drink our water and eat our food and suddenly, you know, we cannot perform for whatever reason. So I think that kind of criticism we should take as uh, impetus to do better. I mean, we need to you know, pull up our socks and get on with it. I think we have the capacity, we have the human resources. And uh, I mean, as an island, I, I mean, if, if you look at tourism, I don't know whether you have, have you traveled to Sri Lanka? Yes, I have. Well, you have, I yes. mean, then you will have your own views of the country. I think yeah. most people who travel have very good impressions of Sri Lanka. Uh, so I, I think we deserve better. Uh, whether we have our leaders have let us down or not, I mean, that's a debate we can have. Uh, so, I mean, to answer your question about Imran Khan, I suppose we have to, okay, try to prove him wrong at some time. That's about all we can do. Grin and bear it for the present. And, and, and try to prove people who point fingers, uh, you know, prove them wrong.
you said that you have no problem of access here you can reach out to the highest levels sir actually just for the viewers sake can you tell us when this horrific scenes were played in your country people entered the pal- presidential uh, and the parliament who did you approach here and how india responded can you if 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 if, if you can tell us uh, like how india responded and if you can give us a glimpse that what happened in the back room all i can say is the three people who have always given me access regardless of any crisis they may be facing one is me dr jayashankar the other is mr doval and the other is vc sitaraman well and they are the three who played a role in this of course the prime minister they consulted with the prime minister's leadership but these three individuals in in different ways uh, played a role in that in fact uh, uh, to uh, to provide the financial support you may recall early in t- uh, 2021 uh, mrs sita raman and uh, dr jayashankar met in the finance ministry and chaired two meetings when our finance minister came i don't think it has ever happened for any other country before the two of them jointly chaired and i think meetings. india also played a role with japan so that was Robin. throughout not only japan with the imf uh, mrs sita raman when she visited uh, uh, washington she is the one who first raised sri lanka with the imf uh with japan both all three spoke to japan uh, external affairs minister spoke finance minister spoke and also nsa spoke i mean how it happened the dynamics of it uh, the mechanics of it i don't want to go into but all i can say is that they have always been accessible to me and to sri lanka sri lanka the so, neighborhood first policy that uh, uh, prime minister modi's uh, government has and i think sri lanka is a major part of that uh, neighborhood first policy of this government no, clearly it has been and and the fact that the amount of money you have given us uh, for demonstrates that you wanted us to stabilize and now in the recovery which is the important phase in a way uh, the fact that we are looking at uh, looking at this uh, cable connection electricity cable connection between india and sri lanka possibly a oil pipeline uh, then trade rupee trade i mean other tourism other ways of because the recovery is going to be the key we have to somehow grow out of this otherwise we are going to have a serious problem and on the back of the recovery uh, we need to do our structural adjustments also our electricity sector the power sector uh, like here we have to look at the private sector getting involved in power generation in power distribution now we have been speaking i have met uh, your power minister also several times just to understand how that works there is a lot of uh, learning that we can do and and that that is also happening i, I think so that that is but sir uh, when people juxtapose uh, sri lanka with pakistan how does it do you think there is any similarity in the situations like uh, politically or economically in any sphere i can't see the parallel i i can't i don't i mean uh, maybe i don't know pakistan well enough but i can't see the parallel i mean it's, it's, sri lanka is a, it's, it's a different situation both in my view economically geopolitically and every aspect uh, i mean pakistan is much more complex even their politi- politics is much more complex than ours i think our political system is similar to yours in many ways i mean uh, so uh, I, i don't think you can really compare the two situations sir after india became the first mover in this crisis do you think that the large public opinion of sri lanka has changed about india like is there more acceptance now and people are seeing india as a better neighbor than any other neighbors in my view definitely and this is the time and of course we have our extremists who will always try to exploit the situation but uh, this is the time i think to move quickly on this integration because of that so you asked i mean you asked me whether there were reservations or people have different views yes but i think i have now i see more of an opening than i would have seen a year ago or five years ago or even on that in your opening remarks sir you said that we have to have better communication when we spoke on the spy ship which recently docked in their country although at that time there were other uh, you know preoccupations but sir when you say that there should be more communication are you admitting that there was lack of communication between the two countries no i think you see i, I think i what i think it was donald rumsfeld who spoke of what uh, known knowns known unknowns and unknown unknowns i think where the better communication has to take place is when it comes to unknown unknowns and also known unknowns because now if you look at the spy ship for us it was a research vessel as it was presented today 
uh, uh, these these technologies are dual purpose technologies. <laughs> I mean, a ship like this can track weather satellites or, or it can track uh, guided missiles. Now, we don't have the capacity to judge that. I mean, obviously, these are complex technologies. So we have to have different uh, structures to engage on these things. And that is what we are trying to work with on, SOPs, structures, and, and to look at one, these unknown unknowns which are bound to take place now more and more, especially as the geopolitical situation gets more complex and the geoeconomic situation gets more complex. We are now you are talking of uh, technologies like uh, 5G technology, you know, then when it comes to uh, also when, it, uh, when you look at uh, the, the, the uh, supply chains, for example, now there's increasingly concerns about supply chains and looking at friendly technologies as opposed to suspicious technologies, whatever it is. Uh, so in, in all these cases, we have to have a communication and understand. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to agree with everything you say, but at least we have to clearly understand what is going on. That's what I mean when I say communication, because you don't need to hit a crisis and then have a conversation. <laughs> because suddenly a ship comes and it's you know, seen to be something that we have one view and you have the other view, and then, then all of it is happening in the middle of a crisis. So let me now uh, get to your life, uh, because many of our viewers like to know about the backstory of diplomats, a backstory of uh, high commissioners and ambassadors who are posted in foreign countries. So now you tell me, why did you choose to be uh, a high commissioner? Why, when you were appointed, what did you think uh, when you came here uh, to India? Well, it's not a politician's job, an ideal job. So why did you choose to come here? It's a tough question because initially, I mean, I've always... I mean, India has been my first love in many ways, and I have had a long relationship with India. But when the then president offered the post to me, I said no, because I wanted to be at home. And, and uh, I didn't see myself as a diplomat. And in fact, uh, he kept the post vacant for nearly one year, and there was uh, even speculation in the newspaper because newspapers, because I kept on telling him, find somebody else. I will help you, but I would prefer, this is not the kind of work I, because I, I, I'm not a diplomat in that way, so it, 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 it's not something that I was interested in. Uh, so then he insisted, then I said, I will take it for a while. And uh, then of course this crisis hmm. came up and I did what I could. Then, uh, then President Vikramasinghe has asked me, was, I was keen that I get back at that time because I feel I have something I would like to do at home. Not necessarily politics, but that I'd like to do something. Uh, so he has asked me to stay a little longer. So that's what it is. I mean, it's, it was not my first choice. Although India, I love, and my wife and I love it. We travel around India. We have gone to many states now right across India. So it, that's not the reason, but that I can do from home as well, frankly. Uh, so, so that was, I mean, uh, bit, I was a bit of a reluctant diplomat, I suppose, to put it that way. That's an interesting term, reluctant diplomat. So, uh, you're a known Indophile. Uh, what aspects of India attract you the most? Well, I think the civilizational connection. I mean, mm. it, it's the more you, because we, we are civilizationally linked. I mean, uh, recently my wife and I went to Hampi, for example. We went Karnataka. To, Vijay, to Vijayanagar. And uh, maybe, I mean, uh, looking, understanding the Chalukya Empire, the, of course, with Sri Lanka, the empires that linked were the Pandians had linkages, the Cholas, obviously, the Cheras. Uh, so the, the, the civilizational connections, the Buddhist connection, of course, it's because as a Buddhist, I, I have, uh, I'm interested in that. And then, of course, today, the, 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 what is happening here? I mean, this is the most exciting place to be in, in every way, and economically as well. And I'm a, I have a business background, so I can see what is happening. And I see Sri Lanka's future as being interlinked. And I mean, some of the ideas we spoke of, I hope they become realities, because if we can achieve that connectivity, the integration, in maybe in the next 10, 15 years, I think some of the more difficult conversations we will not need yeah. to have. <laughs> yeah. That's my belief. Even, the, you know, when you were speaking about the Pandyas, Cholas, Chalukyas, now, uh, most of North India, Western India, Northeast India, is kind of unaware of the impact of uh, these kingdoms because somehow our history texts did not teach us much about it. Yes, South Indian states, they knew 
about it. But the expanse of these kingdoms and the influence these kingdoms had and the Buddhist influence in Southeast Asia, in Eastern Asia, in Sri Lanka is something there's a renewal of interest. So do you think that if Sri Lanka could begin uh, more tourism of, you know, Indian interest locations in your country, uh, is that something that you would look into? Well, actually, when Prime Minister Modi was Chief Minister, at that time I was the Tourism Minister, and uh, I, uh, b b b he invited me for Vibrant Gujarat, I think, in 2009. Interesting, and, really? Uh, yeah, and at uh, that time, I mean, uh, he... he uh, uh, he and we signed an MOU with him at the time uh, to have a Ramayana trail from uh, India to Sri Lanka and a Buddhist trail the other way around. Mm. And uh, that MOU was one of the first Sri Lanka to signed with an Indian state. And it was, I think, one of the first uh, yes. chief minister then Modi signed. He still remembers that MOU. And now we are trying to... Uh, to to uh, duplicate that, I, when I met uh, Chief Minister Yogi, I suggested that we do a similar MOU hmm. to look at Ramayana sites. In fact, when uh, you've done that with Thailand, I think, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, they, they, they are they are yeah. looking at that. And but the Sri Lanka Gujarat one was interesting because it happened yeah. long before, long ago, long ago. And he, he, yeah. he, I mean, it was something he and I discussed at the time, and uh, we did it quite quickly. Uh, so when I arrived here, in fact, we brought, uh, you know, Ashoka Vatika is in Sri yeah. Lanka. Yes. So we brought a stone, I, my wife and I brought a stone from there and uh, presented it to Ayodhya. We went to Ayodhya and presented it to the trustees there. Mm -hmm. And in fact, now uh, the, the, uh, we are also looking at, uh, there are about 40 Ramayana sites, 40 to 50 Ramayana sites in Sri Lanka. So there, there is an effort now to create a tourism trail Using Sita's the uh, it is Ashoka Vatika. Ashoka, Vatika, Ashoka Vatika. Huh. In fact, we we uh, we we uh, we, we uh, that stone from there. Actually, I think we need to present you also. We have a stone, some a small stone oh, from Ashoka Vatika. I will I will send it across to you uh, because it's a stream where the, the going through Ashoka Vatika. The, the stone is from the stone we took. The big one was from there. Hmm. Uh, so Ramayana is one clear connection. Buddhism is a clear connection. Clear connection yes. uh, Buddhism, in fact, uh, I mean, it's not only South India, but our connections go to the north also, even Bihar. to Odisha and yeah. to Bihar. But Odisha is where the, uh, uh, the, the actually the, the Ashoka, uh, when he his uh, the port probably that they came from, uh, the, the daughter and son came from, probably would have been from Odisha. Okay. Uh, so that, that that connection is there. Then, of course, uh, the the uh, Bihar, the, the huh. other other aspects, Gaya of the, and the Gaya, other places, Gaya yes. Well. And and uh, and uh, Sanchi is, of course, the one stupa, of the holiest yes. sites, and that is where they believe that uh, 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 both Emperor Asoka's daughter and son yes. were there, and it's from there that they went across. In fact, it's Odisha. visible there, and the, it's written also. That's right. Check. Yes, it's yes. there. And that's from there, there that they would have come across. So our links are not only to the south, they go up to the north as well. We also believe that the original uh, settlers to Sri Lanka from, were from uh, the, our King Vijay would have come even from Bengal. That is the thinking, mm. that is what it is believed. So we have this whole connection. And then, of course, there is a Kalinga link also because one of the Kalinga kings also invaded Sri Lanka. So, we, I mean, the connections are... Hmm. many to India at different levels. Then we also have a Shiva Shakti trail yes. uh, there because there are the Shiva Shakti temples. Then there are Murugan temples. So there's a Murugan trail. So we are trying to develop these as pilgrimage uh, tourism circuits as well. So Interesting. I would love to do one of those. Could yeah. you tell us a little bit about uh, what happened at Vibrant Gujarat? Uh, which year was this? And it was 2009. Okay. Uh, and I was invited to Vibrant Gujarat and uh, Prime Minister Modi, then Chief Minister Modi was, uh, we were all on the podium. I was tourism minister, there were the different business leaders. That was the year they launched the, the I think the Tata Nano was... Uh, yeah, they, it moved they, from they, West they, Bengal, they, Bengal to, Bengal to, Bengal to So it was a fairly big year even. Uh, yeah. And and, and uh, so each of us, we, we spoke briefly at that uh, morning session. Hmm. And the next day in the morning, I got a message as to whether I could come and uh, meet the chief minister. So uh, the car was sent to me and I went there and he told me, I would like you to do something for me. Could you make the final speech 
at the, to close the meeting. So then I actually told him, you know, I have a flight to catch at, I can't remember what time it was in the evening. He said, don't worry, you'll make the flight. Hmm. And uh, then uh, I, I, I spoke there. And uh, I mean, the, subsequently we signed this uh, next, my next visit, we signed this uh, tourism MOU as well. So that was my first uh, encounter with him, really. You, any aspect you want to highlight? <laughs> I, I think the importance is that, as I said, this relationship is asymmetric. So what is important is from the Indian side, so much going on. Today. So many stakeholders. So the focus has to be there. I mean, as I clearly said, the high level focus is there, but the focus has to be there because this asymmetry has to be clearly understood. I mean, as I said, 22 million people dealing with 1.4 billion and, you know, that's, that's a very yeah. but are asymmetrical But are you saying that uh, on the top it's all okay, but down it's not percolating? No, no, I, I, I wouldn't want to be uh, controversial as that. All I'm saying is that it's a reality that you can't expect complete focus because there are distractions. Mm -hmm. right, so, so Because Tamil Nadu government may have another view. Center has another view. Uh, yeah, the, at the, I mean, I, I have met with Tamil Nadu chief minister also and we have discussed, I mean, there is, there, 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 but the issue is, I mean, India is India. I mean, <laughs> it's huge. So the, the, the focus, so I mean, we, I always say we must fight for attention from our side. I think we try our best to do that given our limited resources. But I think from your side, it is to, now, it's again getting Indian business interested. Mm. I try very hard. But for an Indian uh, company, Sri Lanka is not, not really, you know, it's a big not, market. not there. So uh, sometimes, you know, th th that becomes challenging. Uh, but very often, so I think we need that focus is necessary. And once, I think once the integration takes once place, the connectivity it will be, works, it will be automatic. But the, but the first stage will be difficult. Is the suspicion over, sir? The reason I ask that is because like Naveen asked that question, uh, you know, it always comes up in India about Prabhakaran. It's, you know, we've lost a thousand soldiers uh, in the IPKF, IPKF operation. It's not something, at least my generation will not forget it. Maybe, you know, two generations from now, IPKF will go back uh, into memory people won't remember what happened but my generation remembers the Jaiwardne Rajiv Accord it remembers how we lost it remembers the gory deaths that happened out there uh, and how our forces just came out that and then Rajiv Gandhi's assassination so you know this it keeps coming that we lost a prime minister to foreign terrorists uh, inside India so that suspicion that level that that doesn't go away from our mentality. So, uh, do you feel that uh, the relationship has emerged out of that shadow? I would hope so. I think the trauma is there on both sides, clearly. I mean, as you pointed out, the trauma on your side, on our side, 30 years of war. And I mean, I lost many friends and colleagues to uh, terrorism. Uh, so, I mean, to some, sometimes our generation may have got anesthetized. That's also not a good thing because we saw so much death around us. Yeah. And that's why I keep saying the next generation is what is important and we need to lay the groundwork for the next generation. And and that is should also be part of this. That's why this last three feet, you know, people to people contact, somehow increasing that uh, is, is critical. Because once people start talking to each other, connecting with each other, it changes. I mean, if you go to Chennai, for example, I feel very comfortable in Chennai. But... Uh, Ten years ago, people were fried, worried, Sinhalese were worried to go to Chennai, thinking, you know, mm. uh, what would happen there. And there would have been similar feelings uh, probably there. Uh, so I think finally it is through interaction that this is going to work. I mean, policymakers can do work, but uh, and also we should not make the mistakes of the past. That's important. And especially mm. in the geopolitical field, I think there are lessons to be learned. At that time, there were geopolitical issues involved and, and uh, we... Both paid a price for that. So now we, we have to learn lessons from that as well. Uh, but I think, as you say, our generation, maybe, I mean, we have this and I think we have got over it. I, I don't think, I, I, but still, I, we must make sure that the next generation inherits something better. That's what I think 
we should be doing. That, that's my feeling anyway. On that positive note, thank you very much, sir, for spending time with thank us. Thank you for inviting And me. answering our questions. And uh, our viewers and listeners will get a better understanding of the India-Sri Lanka relationship. Thank you for watching or listening to this podcast. Do like or subscribe on whichever channel you have seen this or heard this. Namaste. Jai Hind. Click here to watch the previous episodes.